Our next speaker this morning is going to be uh, Dr. Natalie Diane. Dr. Diane is an internist and she's the director of obstetrical medicine at the uh, MUHC. So we are very lucky to have her speak to us this morning about uh, hypertensive emergencies in pregnancy. Thanks, Robert. Uh, nice to see you and thanks everybody for having me. Hope everyone's staying safe uh, and hopefully getting vaccinated soon. I'm just going to share my screen now. And okay. Okay. So, um, also, thanks for that talk, Kyle. I just caught the end of that, and it has me. Um, you know, we have been using ECMO for cardiac arrest in pregnancy, and of course there's no RCT, um, but since we are talking about severe hypertension in pregnancy, which can result in, you know, morbidity and, and even mortality, um, I do wonder how that's going to play out in the pregnant population. So I, I think that's really, really interesting direction. So I'll be talking to you about severe hypertension in pregnancy, which, um, you know, you, you probably see to some extent in the emergency room, um, although a lot of these patients get triaged uh, to the birthing center, the initial management is very important as you'll see. So um, I have no disclosures other than the fact that there's an entire journal as well as a society devoted just to this topic. So in, um, uh, so, you know, we'll only be scratching the surface in, in this morning in, uh, in about a half hour. So these are the objectives for today's talk. We'll be reviewing the epidemiology, but also contemporary diagnostic criteria for the hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. And I'll share with you the role of some biomarkers um, that will be coming to the MUHC very soon and may be helpful in a quick rule out of preeclampsia. Uh, we'll be reviewing general management of mostly the hypertensive urgencies um, in pregnancy. And I'll also be sharing with you a draft MUHC protocol um, or a toolkit. And also we'll touch on the postpartum and long-term implications. If you do see women postpartum and are not sure how to arrange follow-up, I will um, hopefully you know, give you some information about that. So this is a photo of Larry and Lauren Bloomstein. There, um, this is a US couple, you know, they had just gotten married just before 2010. Um, and Larry is a was a is a trauma surgeon in New Jersey. Um, and uh, so an orthopedic trauma surgeon and uh, Lauren, his wife, uh, is a NICU nurse at the same hospital. That's where they met, you know, very classic medical love story. They got married and a couple years later, she was pregnant with their first child. Uh, she was 33 years old at the time, very healthy and fit. Um, and, uh, you know, she had a very normal pregnancy other than some fatigue, normal weight gain, everything was going well. Um, at about 39 uh, plus three, she presented in labor and, uh, you know, gave birth to a healthy baby girl and didn't feel well after birth. Um, her, uh, her blood pressure was noted to be elevated on several occasions, um, including up to, um, you know, 170 over 105, even up to 110, multiple readings that were elevated. Uh, the obstetrician was notified. And at the time, um, um, you know, basically just asked for uh, the blood pressure to be remeasured and for her to be monitored. She was complaining of significant headache, um, upper uh, epigastric pain, was feeling quite nauseated and, you know, just didn't feel well. This was now, you know, two, uh, Two, uh, two days or second day um, after the uncomplicated birth. Um, so essentially the next day, unfortunately, uh, she felt really unwell, had blurred vision, um, had a hemorrhagic stroke and died. And this is, um, this got a lot of attention and was re uh, written up um, and really became sort of viral. This was a NICU nurse, a uh, wife of a physician at a hospital who uh, had a preventable maternal mortality due to a hypertensive urgency that was 
not well treated. And this is not in Sub-Saharan Africa. This was in um, the, the US. Um, and so this exposed essentially a lot of the preventable uh, mortalities as well as morbidity in the US, which um, had increased uh, up to 25 per 100,000 in comparison, to, which was much, much higher than um, uh, than other developed countries. In fact, uh, an American woman um, is thought to be about three times higher risk of death uh, when she's pregnant compared to other industrialized countries. So that's the story of Lauren and Larry. So essentially uh, preeclampsia, which is one of the forms of uh, hypertensive disorder of pregnancy can affect uh, two to 8% of pregnancies, often uh, more often in first pregnancies and um, the uh, prevalence or incidence is actually closer to 10% if you include other hypertensive disorders. Uh, there are about 4 million new cases per year and the incidence is similar across the globe, although the morbidity associated with it differs according to where you live in the world. It is a major cause of morbidity and mortality, both in the developed and undeveloped world, which I'll show you. And at the MUHC, um, of course, uh, there are about 3,500 uh, deliveries per year. And in 2019, there were just about 400 women who had preeclampsia, which is about 11%. But remember that we do accept um, a lot of uh, transfers from other hospitals. That's why our incidence is probably a little bit higher. And of these, about a quarter have preeclampsia with severe hypertension. And among these, um, there are some you know, morbidities that have even um, uh, occurred here, although thankfully in at least the recent past, no, uh, no mortalities and no severe morbidities that I'm aware of. So in terms of the global impact of maternal mortality, this is a WHO map where the light um, countries that are in light blue uh, have low maternal mortality rates and then dark blue have higher maternal mortality rates. So we're about here in Canada at uh, typically under 10 per 100,000 uh, deaths per uh, year, uh, 10 per 100,000 uh, live births that is. And in Sub-Saharan Africa, it's uh, upwards of 1%. So obviously a huge disparity according to where you live. And the leading causes worldwide of maternal uh, death are hemorrhage, infection, and preeclampsia and eclampsia. And just, you know, um, uh, preeclampsia and eclampsia, and probably all three of these are to some degree preventable. And so this is uh, data from Canada. And unfortunately, it's not updated as frequently as it should be. But this is up till about 2010. And as you can see, we're hovering around the 10 per 100,000 as far as our mortality rate. And the leading causes of maternal death are as follows. So very similar to, um, you know, sort of across the world, really mirrored here in Canada. So hypertension and pregnancy being a major cause of mortality. And how do women with hypertensive um, disorders of pregnancy die? By and large, as you can see here, this is US data, but it's really the same everywhere. Um, they die from stroke um, and mostly hemorrhagic. So this is um, uh, sort of an inquiry into the uh, deaths in the US by the CDC. And so um, over a 14 year period, and there were 4,000 deaths that were looked at. Um, so 20% of those were from preeclampsia. And among those that were from preeclampsia, as you can see, um, cerebrovascular events were the most common, and most of them were hemorrhagic. So this is really what um, we want to prevent when we're treating severe hypertension in pregnancy is we want to prevent stroke. We also, of course, want to prevent um, seizures or eclampsia, uh, and, and, and we'll talk about that later. And there are other, um, you know, severe complications such as HELP syndrome, um, which is, tr uh, you know, a bit trickier to treat other than delivery. So uh, the definitions of preeclampsia have really changed over time. Historically, it used to be called toxemia of pregnancy. Um, the, wor the word eclampsia is a Greek word for sudden onset. And so that that's sort of, it was noted in a um, uh, very long time ago. So it's really a concept, this whole concept of preeclampsia and the related syndromes has been uh, uh, 
identified for a very long time, but the definitions themselves have changed. There used to be definitions only including a diastolic blood pressure, um, and recently there that has changed. Um, edema used to be part of the definition, which again has changed. So the more contemporary definition, and this is from Hypertension Canada, it's much more straightforward um, uh, than it used to be. So you uh, basically what we would call hypertension, even outside of pregnancy. So the same cutoff values would be considered hypertension in pregnancy. And once you have these elevated values, you essentially look at how um, far along the woman is in her pregnancy, less than 20 weeks or greater than 20 weeks. If it's less than 20 weeks, it's typically um, considered to be chronic or pre-pregnancy hypertension who should be, and these individuals should be followed for the development of preeclampsia or worsening of hypertension. And if beyond 20 weeks, then you have to look at, well, is this gestational hypertension or preeclampsia? And the way you do that is you look at the presence of target organ involvement. So, um, uh, so that's essentially how, how we would define it now and target organ involvement, I'll talk about in a moment. Um, just to be aware that severe hypertension in pregnancy is uh, a systolic blood pressure of 160 or above and a diastolic blood pressure of 110 or above. And that's very different than what we've considered a, a hypertensive urgency outside of pregnancy. So, um, but, the, but these are the cutoffs and I'll show you a little bit why um, we use these lower cutoff values for women who are pregnant and postpartum. And I also want to draw your attention to the fact that um, we uh, that there's non-severe preeclampsia as well as more severe preeclampsia, including the HELP syndrome or eclampsia. We don't ever call preeclampsia mild, and the reason is is because preeclampsia can evolve into severe preeclampsia um, very rapidly and suddenly. So um, uh, it, it would be a misnomer, and and you know might. Uh, that the implications might be that um, uh, that the surveillance would be, you know, a little bit more relaxed if we call it mild preeclampsia. So we really stay away from calling uh, preeclampsia mild. It's non-severe or severe. And the target org involvement in preeclampsia would include any one of the following proteinuria, acute kidney injury, liver involvement, neurological complications, including severe headache, stroke, uh, press or eclampsia, hematologic, and uteroplacental dysfunction, such as fetal growth restriction. So what's really in important to note is that um, you may have preeclampsia even without the presence of proteinuria. Proteinuria is just one of the possible um, target organ involvement. And in our lab, uh, 0.28 grams per gram would be sort of the cutoff for uh, significant proteinuria to uh, warrant the consideration of the diagnosis. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about biomarkers for preeclampsia because we uh, there's been a lot of uh, research on the use of these um, uh, of certain angiogenic biomarkers for the diagnosis of preeclampsia recently. Uh, and it's now being incorporated in you know, many centers. And in fact, uh, we are going to be getting uh, uh, this at the MUHC very soon. So what I'm showing you here on the left is the difference in placentation between normal pregnancy and preeclampsia. So in, in normal pregnancy, the placenta needs to implant into the endometrial wall, and there's um, vascular remodeling that happens, uh, and then the blood flow increases, and you know there's um, the the and the placenta grows and provides. Um, blood flow for the for the growing fetus. In preeclampsia, uh, what's thought to be the origins of preeclampsia is that there is an absence of vascular remodeling. So insufficient blood flow and hypoxia and ischemia that eventually leads to cytokine release, endothelial damage and dysfunction, and the syndrome. And this is um, a very early on uh, the two biomarkers that are important in this um, abnormal placentation are placental growth factor, PLGF, and um, uh, soluble FMS-like tyrosine kinase. So placental growth factor is part of the VEGF family. It's a protein involved in placental angiogenesis. And typically it, in normal pregnancy, it does rise in keeping with the placental growth and, and vascularization and peaks at 26 to 30 weeks. In abnormal placentation, it doesn't rise, so it stays low. 
whereas S-split is an anti-angiogenic factor that disables placental growth factor as well as VEGF. And in normal pregnancy, there is some anti-angiogenesis um, sort of, you know, as a checkpoint, but in abnormal placentation, S-split really increases dramatically. So there is a rise in S-split, a rise in anti-angiogenesis and a um, decrease of the placental growth factor such that the ratio um, is hot, uh, of S-split to PLGF is high in a preeclamptic pregnancy. And so essentially there have been a number of studies that have looked at uh, using uh, both the PLGF test by itself or the ratio. Um, and there are a number of, uh, of pharma companies that, um, that, uh, that develop these. Uh, what's interesting is that the PLGF test is a uh, point of care test. Uh, whereas the S-split over PLGF, uh, most of them do take a couple of hours in the lab. But um, a variety of studies, both um, diagnostic, uh, observational cohorts, and also a really interesting step wedge RCT, the PARROT study, have looked at PLGF and essentially uh, at a cutoff of 100, where um, if uh, if Somebody's PL, somebody presents with, you know, an elevated blood pressure and perhaps a headache, and their PLGF test is more than a uh, hundred. The um, negative predictive uh, value of preeclampsia within and delivery within the next several weeks is very, very high. Um, whereas the rule-in threshold is really a much lower cutoff and indicates more severe preeclampsia. In the PARROT study, looking at the use of PLGF and there was a blinded assessment of PLGF um, uh, by, by um, you know, two groups and it was a, the step wedge uh, RCT. There, uh, there did seem to be a reduction in time to diagnosis of about three days, as well as a reduction in severe uh, morbid outcomes. So PLGF is a really interesting test. And I think that in the future, this will be used as part of the diagnostic criteria. Similarly, the S-flit over PLGF ratio has been looked at where a ratio less than 38 um, is considered to be a rule out threshold. This paper was published about five years ago in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, and so you could see some of the others. So overall, there really is a lot of promise for the use of these biomarkers and the diagnosis of preeclampsia and also for rule out. So if a woman presents with severe headache, there are other potential um, etiologies that you may want to consider, um, including preeclampsia, but it, perhaps if um, you use one of these tests then you would be thinking of something else like cerebral vein thrombosis, for example. So moving on to um, therap uh, therapeutics and the management. Um, so the therapeutic principles are essentially prevent maternal complications of acute severe hypertension, immediate management of suspected preeclampsia, prevent eclampsia and prevent fetal complications. And of course, in the emergency room, uh, you know, I think you're really mostly focused on like, uh, the preventing maternal complications, getting obstetrics uh, or maternal fetal medicine involved and consider preventing eclampsia and you won't be really touching on preventing the fetal complications. So for treating maternal hypertension, the goal is really to prevent stroke, as mentioned, as well as pulmonary edema um, and coronary syndromes. And in terms of the targets, um, outpatient targets are, you know, we really are now targeting based on uh, evidence within the last five years that we could be stricter in our control of uh, hypertension and pregnancy as um, uh, in the ambulatory setting. So we do target a diastolic of about 85 and we treat uh, when it's above 140 over 90 essentially. But inpatient, it's really important to treat um, under once to aim for less than 160 over 110 within one hour if somebody presents with severe hypertension. Um, and these are the drugs that we use. You're probably familiar with them. So rapid acting nifedipine, labetalol, PO or IV, um, hydralazine IV. And then methyl dopa and hydrochlorothiazide are other agents that we can use for non-urgent hypertension in pregnancy. Uh, I'm sure you know of the drugs to avoid in pregnancy. The key ones to avoid would be atenolol, ACE inhibitors, and ARBs. Okay, so why the cutoff of 160 millimeters uh, systolic? Uh, by and large, this is a, it's a small study, but this study really changed our 
focus on um, in pregnancy from diastolic hypertension, which really um, impacts the fetus to systolic hypertension, which really impacts the mother. So looking, um, and this was a, a US cohort, it was published you know, about 15 years ago, uh, and it was uh, looking at the blood pressures pre and post stroke uh, in women who had um, uh, who women uh, women who had stroke during pregnancy, and as you can see here, all the strokes really occurred at a systolic blood pressure above 160, and the diastolics were really above uh, 100. And this was a marked rise from their baseline blood pressure, um, and and that really um, brings us to the neurovascular. Um, neurovascular adaptations in pregnancy, which are uh, a reduction in cerebral autoregulation, increased cerebral perfusion pressure, and uh, the blood-brain barrier is more permeable in pregnancy. So all of those lead to basically a sensitivity to these rapid changes in blood pressure and more uh, predisposition towards hemorrhage and edema. So um, I'm going to share with you now, this is a draft protocol prepared by uh, Dr. Isabel Malhame and Dr. Karen Wu, who's an obstetrician here. Isabel is an uh, internist who also practices obstetric medicine, as well as um, some um, individuals from nursing. And this is very similar to the toolkits that have de been developed elsewhere and uh, will really hopefully help to standardize the treatment of uh, hypertension and pregnancy. So essentially, if you have a severe hypertension, which is systolic, uh, you know, which we discuss 160 over 110, it should be repeated and confirmed in 15 minutes. Um, and so at that time, a, uh, the obstetric team should be advised, you, you know, uh, ABCs and consider the administration of uh, magnesium sulfate for severe preeclampsia to prevent seizures. And then you would follow the obstetric hypertensive emergency treatment algorithm, which would include one of the following, IV labetalol, hydralazine, oral short, short acting nifedipine. So if you're going to be using labetalol IV, um, you would start with 20 milligrams IV, which after 10 minutes you can double, and then 10 minutes later you could double again. And thereafter you should be calling the ICU, calling for help, consider a uh, labetalol drip or change in change um, change treatment course. Uh, and what's really interesting is that first of all, initially on the obstetrics wards, um, labetalol IV was not administered because it was the hospital policy was that it required cardiac monitoring. So um, they were able to establish this protocol without monitoring um, other than monitoring the blood pressure and pulse. Um, the other thing is that nurses in this protocol um, can give at least one dose of nifedipine PO as per a preprinted standing order. And uh, they, th this can't be repeated. It could be given once and then they, you know, follow the protocol of calling the OB resident and uh, the staff. So this might be interesting in the emergency room setting as well. So a similar algorithm for hydralazine, where you would start with five milligrams and then 20 minutes later, um, 10 milligrams IV, and the same would go for um, the option of giving nifedipine five milligrams times one. And then uh, using nifedipine, um, after the first dose, which you would start with five, then 10, then 20. Um, and those would be have to be prescribed specifically by an MD. Um, um, essentially, um, th th those are the three different agents that we would be using for an emergency. Just a caution, labetalol should not be used in anybody with severe asthma. And um, in some situations can cause fetal bradycardia. So fetal monitoring is recommended for um, treatment of you know, use, use of these IV agents. So the other thing that is really important is to prevent eclampsia. So um, I'm sharing with you the MAGPI trial. It's an older trial, but I think we all know that uh, magnesium treats eclampsia, but it also prevents eclampsia and, and death. 
in women with severe preeclampsia. This was an international RCT of 10,000 women. And at the time, uh, women just had to have preeclampsia and a criteria for severity in which the physician was considering the use of magnesium sulfate. And they were randomly assigned to magnesium um, uh, bolus than one gram per hour or placebo. Uh, of note, the treatment for eclampsia is two grams per hour. So there was a 50% reduction in eclampsia and reduced maternal mortality. So this is now standard of care and it has been studied in non-severe preeclampsia and it's not beneficial in non-severe preeclampsia. So it's really in severe preeclampsia. Typically the obstetricians do make this call, uh, whereas in the emergency room setting, um, certainly if somebody has uh, you know, seizures, they should be given magnesium. But, you know, I think if there's expected to, to be a delay to transfer to the obstetrics ward in severe preeclampsia, the, the, the symptoms that typically precede the onset of seizures would be severe headaches and scotomas. I'm just going to share with you a case as the sort of last uh, part of this talk. Um, and this is a, a, a real case, a 37 year old, previously healthy uh, G3P1. She had a pregnancy complicated by gestational diabetes. And at 35 weeks, she had a borderline blood pressure. Uh, she um, had PPROM at 36 weeks, she was induced. She had sort of borderline blood pressures throughout labor. And then five days later, she presented to the emergency room with a gradual throbbing headache. And this was her blood pressure. She was treated as having a migraine. Um, these were her labs. She had a, a bit of a transaminitis, as you can see. And then two hours later, she had a generalized seizure that was treated with Ativan. Um, she had neuroimaging and an LP, both were normal. Um, and uh, essentially then uh, she, she was found to have uh, uh, she would be hyperreflexic and she had a recurrent seizure. And so just to remember, this was not a, this was not a McGill case, but it was a case that was published in the CMAJ, um, that postpartum hypertension does, um, can result in seizures, um, and preeclampsia can be diagnosed postpartum. Uh, it's, um, the classically three to six days after delivery is the peak blood pressure due to mobilization of extracellular fluid. So it's sort of the time of peak blood volume and patients with severe preeclampsia or any hypertensive disorder pregnancy, antepartum are actually at risk uh, for worsening in the postpartum period. Uh, so most often they do resolve by six weeks, but they may persist up to three months and um, can also reflect new or pre-existing chronic hypertension. Postpartum eclampsia can occur even without pre-existing preeclampsia, so it can occur suddenly, and up to one third actually do occur postpartum. Um, and it's been described up to three weeks postpartum. So while the overall incidence of eclampsia worldwide has declined, late onset eclampsia has not, and a lot of that has to do with failures in identification. And these are the MRI findings that can be found um, in somebody with, uh, you know, seizures or severe preeclampsia with neurovascular complications, so vasogenic edema. Uh, so, so, um, so something to consider that in the postpartum period, coming with headache and hypertension, this could be just preeclampsia. One other thing I do want to mention is that um, the pro, uh, not to rely on proteinuria uh, um, for diagnosis in the postpartum period. Um, and really, it's a clinical syndrome and severe headaches and severe hypertension is preeclampsia in the postpartum period. Uh, so the post preeclampsia sequelae, just quickly, what can happen after delivery? So in the next pregnancy, this is somebody that we identify to be at high risk for recurrence. But also in the woman's lifetime, there's a lot of literature, and this is an area of um, personal interest of mine that I um, uh, pursuing a lot of research studies in. So a woman is at risk for three times higher risk of hypertension in the next, next decade, end-stage renal disease, um, cardiovascular diseases, and mostly ischemic heart disease. So twofold increased risk in uh, premature, so before the age 55 or premenopausal, cardiovascular disease in the, in the next decade, and as well as stroke. So even though the absolute risk is small because they're young women, the relative risk is really significant. And this has been replicated in numerous studies and, and several uh, meta-analyses 
all consistently finding this. So we do recommend postpartum follow-up and screening. So that it, both in the early postpartum period and the delayed. So blood pressure should be measured three to six days postpartum because of what I showed you. It's the peak uh, blood pressure rise. We should ensure that all preeclampsia bloods do normalize by six weeks. Um, uh, and somebody who's had severe preeclampsia should be screening for certain thrombophilia, specifically antiphospholipid syndrome, as well as chronic hypertension and secondary causes such as hyperaldosteronism or renal disease. Um, a lot of obesity and metabolic syndrome that needs to be addressed. Um, and, um, you know, a number of different metabolic, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, evaluation that, that we should do. Um, so uh, we should also be preventing preeclampsia recurrence. Uh, and this is something we can talk about, you know, in the, in the postpartum period uh, we would recommend calcium and aspirin, which I won't get into, but there is very high quality evidence showing that aspirin does lower the risk of recurrent preeclampsia. So you may see early pregnant women on aspirin and we should be, um, uh, following these women for postpartum vascular risk reduction. There are targeted postpartum vascular risk reduction clinics that exist now, and we have one here at the MUHC. We should be considering um, uh, evidence-based therapy uh, and um, a, a lot of the agents that are not approved in pregnancy are okay to be given in breastfeeding women. So this is our postpartum clinic, the Maternal Cardiovascular Health Clinic, in which we see women three to six months postpartum for review of their cardiovascular and metabolic profiles, counseling, um, and management of their risk factors. And I will share with you the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the fax and phone number, and we do see we welcome any referrals of women who present with a, a hypertensive disorder of pregnancy or um, uh, um, gestational diabetes as well. So the take home messages are that the hypertensive disorders of pregnancy are common, they occur on a spectrum. Um, you can have proteinuria or an adverse condition to be called preeclampsia. In the therapeutic principles would be to prevent eclampsia, treat severe hypertension and prevent fetal complications. And don't forget about postpartum preeclampsia. It can occur and it can turn into eclampsia. So I'll take any questions and I'm just gonna share with you here some um, phone numbers and faxes in case they are useful to you if you see patients like this in the ER. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Diane. That was a really great talk. Um, there were a couple of questions that came up during your talk, but you actually already went on to answer them. Um, so I don't know if, if anyone has any other questions that they want to unmute themselves or write in the chat. Um, I don't see the chat. 